based on Dear Esther. And I'm Jessica Curry, and I was the composer on the game. So what you're looking at today is a remake of a remake of a mod. Um, Dear Esther started off in 2007 as a Half-Life 2 mod um, that did really, really well in the modding community, which was fantastic, and as a result of that attracted the attention of Rob, who worked as the primary developer on a Source remake of the game that was released in 2012. And this year is another remake where the, it's been updated for a cross-platform release. And we wanted to add in this developer's commentary just to give you a bit more of an insight into some of the ideas behind the game as it came together. So you'll see around you in a lot of the environments, there's, there's a lot of detail ingrained into everything. Um, one of the things that I wanted to do with Dear Esther is uh, bring the visuals up to the same kind of level of detail that Dan and Jess had put into the other areas of the game. So um, all of the history and the kind of hidden pieces of story that are intertwined with the VOs and the music and stuff, I, I kind of wanted to bring some of that into the environments. Uh, so if you look around you, you see that there's a lot of interesting bits and pieces, a piece of paper with someone's name on it, uh, a photograph, uh, an ultrasound. All of these little bits and pieces are kind of laid in to just kind of bring another aspect of the story uh, into the game. And also, they're actually randomised, so every time you play you'll see something different lying around. And this is just to build on this idea that everybody has a unique experience and a unique uh, interpretation of the story. Part of the point about the whole game, I think, was this idea that rather than having a linear, straight-through version of the story, that we could have multiple story units for each place you were. And I was really interested in this idea of how you can open up that space that people can interpret. So I loved the idea that you could have two people that had played this game and then would uh, have a conversation about it, and one of them would say, oh, what did you think about when this happened? And the other person would be like, well, that didn't happen for me. I had a completely different event happen or a completely different story happen. And it kind of feels very gamey in that way that actually one of the things I love about writing for games is that you hand over so much control to the player that it becomes their story and that's really, really important rather than trying to force them. So using randomised uh, blocks of voiceover in the game and the kind of randomised prop details that Rob was talking about means that it gives it a really different feeling every time you go through. And that was really, that's kind of interesting for me because I like the idea of going, well... Not everyone has to have the same experience, and because it's interactive, you have the capacity to have very different experiences occupying the same space. So yeah, but balancing all that then becomes a, an absolute nightmare. I think it's nice though, because everybody gets a personal experience. Like I love reading the forums and seeing how people come, uh, come and they sort of tell their story and what they interpreted of it, and then you see other people discussing what they thought of it. And to me it's kind of nice because everybody else, every, everybody takes something unique away from it. When I wrote the music for the mod of Dear Esther, there was absolutely no budget whatsoever for uh, live players, so all the music was sampled. But one of the good things about that is it actually forced me to be quite creative about how I wrote the music. So with my background in sound art, I wanted to use samples in a different way that wasn't just um, using it to sound like a violin. I wanted to time stretch and manipulate samples to make something different and strange and quite unique. Um, but then when we got the indie fund money, I had the amazing opportunity to re-record the music with live players. And that was so exciting for me, actually, because that's where it comes to life. And I thought long and hard about whether to write new music, um, going from the mod uh, to the commercial version. But actually, I decided that my initial and original emotional response to the game was probably going to be the strongest response and reaction that I had. So I just literally, the music that I'd written for samples, I then wrote out for uh, live instruments. But what they bring to it is transformative, actually. And I think the beach is a really good example of this, where you, know, you have these awful samples soaring away, and then you have the string quartet playing this very bleak, very sparse music, and they bring 
the presence of the island immediately to it and it comes to life. And that's the exciting thing about it. It wasn't a huge budget, but just having that experience of working with the players was just magical. Everything about Esther for me is a dream. The, the landscape is not an island, it's the dream of an island. The music is like music that you you wake up because you've heard in your sleep, but you, you're not conscious of hearing it. And the language in the story was supposed to be like that as well. Of It didn't matter the sense it made, it was more about the, the kind of the shapes it created, if that makes sense. So that the words would kind of, were like a, like, like being in water, like listening to something underwater, it'd be this, this very dreamlike, symbolic, poetic thing. And it always had frustrated me in games with game writing. This has really changed quite a lot. There was never any space for poetic language. It was very expositionally, very descriptive, very direct. And you'd have, like, art and audio would have these amazing creative spaces they could explore. But when it came down to actually writing, you just had to basically go into the room, describe the character, tell the player what to do. And it just seemed like the most boring thing you could do with words in a game. And why couldn't a writer have the same artistic freedom as a visual artist or an audio designer or a, or a musician in terms of being able to say, isn't this just about creating this, this kind of emotional tone, this emotional space? Um, and it's really, I, I still love that about the game. It's one of the things I love so much about Nigel's voiceover is it has this really odd, disconnected, kind of dreamlike quality to it where you might finish the game and not actually understand anything that happened, but you'd have been carried along in the flow of it. Um, and without any kind of sarcasm at all, I get into trouble saying things like this. The same design principle applies as this to Halo. It's 30 seconds of fun, or 30 seconds of, of depressing engagement, I guess, in our case. But it is about that loop of being in the moment in the game constantly, and that's actually the critical thing that matters. This symbol on the beach, um, which is the uh, golden ratio, is it's one of the only things that's, that's really left explicitly from the mod. In the original mod, there was an awful lot of um, more kind of symbols and uh, kind of a much more kind of mystical sort of magical element to the island. There was a lot of very weird stuff in there. And a lot of them came out of the commercial version because they felt like they were a little bit explicit. I mean, instead, there's a lot more hidden kind of codes and symbols in there. There's still some, some stuff which you can only actually see or experience if you are not playing the game, if you're looking at it from editor. Um, we had in the original mods things like trees planted to mirror um, the shape of the M5, or there's a, whole, there's a whole bunch of things that are there to represent star clusters and all kinds of things like that. And we'll probably talk a bit more about kind of like hidden details and, and the secrets in the game as we go through. But that was really interesting for us in terms of the design of it of going, you've got your kind of, your conscious, explicit play experience, but games are always constantly manipulating your mood and your feelings and the decisions you're making. And so really trying to create a space that had all of these kind of subliminals in it was a really interesting thing that we wanted to do, both with the original, and then I think it got lifted up into a much more sophisticated version when we went to the commercial, because Rob was able to bring that sort of level of artistry to the visuals that really got that kind of uh, sense of hidden meaning in there. And that was really important, given how kind of complex and symbol-heavy and poetic the story is, where a lot of it doesn't, again, doesn't actually make any sense, but it's about kind of leaving you with these... I guess like the half-life of ideas and thoughts that you can't quite shake that stay with you. So we really were trying to get that blend of, of how music, uh, story and visuals could all create that really sort of uncanny structure that you wouldn't necessarily be able to define properly but you knew it, it kind of had a meaning that was staying with you. So something I wanted to do as an artist um, was create uh, some kind of reward for the player when they explore the island. There are some areas of the game where it's a little bit more quieter, there's, there's no music or there's no voiceovers. So I kind of wanted to create a bit of an incentive uh, for people to explore. And you'll find around the island that these, these kind of like uh, random uh, scattered items that, that uh, 
usually slightly out of place from the environment themselves, but in in another aspect, they actually bring a little bit of uh, story um, to the island itself. Usually to the island or to the to the actual uh, protagonists or, or you know the characters that surround it. Um, so you'll find it around the island these these little props and stuff. Uh, just keep your eye out for it if you're exploring. So people have asked why the um, Dear Esther's set on a Hebridean island. What's really interesting about this is it's one of those times when your kind of aspirations as an artist and the practical realities kind of dovetail. We knew that we had to have some way of limiting the player from disappearing off the play space. And when we made the original, it was a modern, because it was a Half-Life 2 mod, you kind of had Eastern European city, spaceship, or blasted, desolate landscape. We had three options if you didn't want to start making any other assets. So. It started off with these practical constraints. We don't want to set it on a spaceship. We don't want to set it in an Eastern European city. So it's got to be on this kind of like this desolate landscape. And we want to limit the player. So an island seems like a natural choice. And it's really interesting how you start from that. And we had this big lump of clay on a table that we were carving out paths and things to annoy the cleaners and things like that. And Jess and I were talking and Jess started making sort of snippets of music to kind of go in there. And then all of a sudden we just went, oh, that's the story. Oh, that's what happened here. But it really started, I think, from the place. And when we started looking at photographs of, of, of Bore, we started going and reading some of the history behind it. Suddenly that was it. And it just was really, really naturally became, this is the place. This is what happened here. This is how it feels. And then everything else kind of coalesced around that. Um, yeah, I think as an artist, it made my job a lot easier because those islands are so kind of like the, the the environment is kind of hostile. You're out there in the the, the Hebrides. Uh, you've got this kind of like inclement weather. You've got cold rain, snow. It's it's a very kind of uh, it can be a very uh, depressing place to be at times. But it's also at the same time very beautiful. And it's it's this kind of like stark, bare landscape, uh, but has that has this beautiful surroundings. So it's in terms of art, I think it really helped me uh, to, to portray a lot of the, the themes in Dear Esther. Um, and there was a natural fit with the music as well. The, the, yeah. It suggested a musical style, which was really key. One of the things you're always trying to do as a composer is create memorable themes. And uh, a slight confession is that the probably the most memorable theme, which is uh, Remember in Dear Esther, wasn't actually created for the game. Um, <laughs> Rob's I'm looking shot. <laughs> <laughs> so it was actually from um, a piece of choral music that I'd written years uh, before, uh, based on a Christina Rossetti poem called Remember. And one of the things I was talking about earlier was how I didn't have any budget. So I had this piece of choral music and I thought, hang on, this is absolutely perfect for Esther, but I don't want to use all of it. So the only bit that you actually get in the game is the first line of the choral piece of music. But that actually went on to form the main theme of the music that I wrote. And I think for me, it's really interesting about how things that you've written earlier, years before, sometimes come in really, really useful and fit. So I always tell people and students not to despair if something doesn't get used or doesn't work at the time, because actually there'll come a place or in a time where you think, hang on a minute, I've got something that fits. So in terms of that memorable theme, the Remember theme gets used in multi multitude of different ways during the game. And one of the things it does is helps you to identify the kind of psychic place that you're in in the game. Um, so the theme is played in lots of different ways and actually you'll notice that as you go through the game it becomes more and more broken and more and more manipulated and broken down as the player goes through the journey and as you're psychologically struggling to get to the end point in the game. So music's really, really useful for highlighting the psychological mood and we talk a lot about psychogeography, which always sounds a bit, oh, 
um, bit pretentious, but actually I think it's really important to what the three of us did in the game. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dan, maybe you want it's to talk about that. Sort of like the cool that. kind of idea about psychogeography, if you're not in the place you're in is not the place you're in or, or you create yeah. the place you're in it's not just as you're here and then the landscape's out there but you don't navigate like a city by street signs and by those kind of formal things you navigate it by the things which are significant to you in the way that you've lived in that space and I think that was really kind of key to I think it's really central to how the fusion of art and story and music come together in Dear Esther because it's not a place where we're going right, we have to lead the player up here because it's a natural formation and then you would naturally have a piece of music here because you come around a corner, but the story, music and art all work around the idea of what's going on in the narrator's head at this point. How do we represent his emotional state relative to this landscape? And again, it's that idea of the game is, it's a dream of a place. It's like a, the idea of it being a fever dream or a coma dream, which obviously ties in a lot with the kind of story and we'll come back to it in a lot more detail when we get to the caves a bit later on. White lines. Yeah. They actually did this. It was really cool. I found this historical document. They used to do this on Bora and the Hebrides. If their disease broke out, really? they'd actually chip out and expose the chalk. I so if you're know. on a boat and you were coming to the island, you'd know not to land because it was infectious, which is the coolest, most amazing. It's one of those things where you go, it's almost impossible as a writer to come up with something as cool as that. It just has to be something that was actually done. And it's so sad as well. And I love this bit and the fact that we can do it because it... It feels really real because it references a real thing. And I know there's something really special about that, but it was always one of those bits in the game that I thought, we've got to be able to represent this somehow. We have to be able to get these things in here. Yeah, I mean, that's really interesting. I actually didn't know that was actually based historically in, in real life, but that's that's really cool. Because, I, I mean, I, I, my thing about the white lines is that it, is, it was kind of... It was this completely surreal thing, but also it was kind of... It, it just added to the landscape. It was like, whoa, what the hell is that? Um, um, and putting that into the game was was kind of challenging because to me it just seemed like, oh, this is it's going to be really hard to pull off uh, in a way that's kind of realistic. But then when you look at the the kind of art style of the game, it's not really a realistic thing. Like everything is is uh, half imagined. So you've it, in that way it kind of really fit into the landscape and it kind of creates this amazing. Um, Sort of landmark that you that that you see in the environment, and uh, I just find it really interesting to hear about that. You know? I think it's one of those things where it's not a realistic place, and I mean, no game is a realistic mm -hmm. place anyway. But one of those things where understanding that you're making something which isn't real, and you have that kind of capacity to be sort of to explore it artistically, and we'll come back and talk about sort of like it not being realistic. I think in in a little while. But that's really, really important because then you can say it's what it's about what these things kind of represent or how they make you feel as a player, not about going, is this accurate? And I love, mm. I get really inspired by sort of doing a lot of research into kind of history and things like that with all of our games um, because you can just find those things that just kind of like speak to you. But it's amazing you can find that in like an 18th century book and go, that really speaks to me now, that has meaning now. And that's fascinating, I think. Something that I wanted to bring through in the art of the game was was the same kind of fidelity that you find in the both Jessica's music and Dan's writing. Uh, in the same kind of way that you have all of these little details, these very uh, close attentions to detail that that kind of really bring richness to the story. And something that was missing in the original mod version was just this lack of of, of a visual layer of story. Um, and something that I did. Uh, throughout the the art of the game is to add in all these little details here and there, little bits of story, little links to certain things that you may or may not hear or see, um, just a, a layer of richness in the world and give you some kind of reward for exploring. So keep your eye out as you look around. There's a scene in Donnie Darko where Drew Barrymore's playing uh, his English teacher and she talks about cellador as being the most beautiful word in the English language and about how it's the sound of the words together. And Dear Esther actually comes from the introduction to From a Faith No More song, the Crab song on the first album, Introduce Yourself. And there's a point where um, 
I think it's Chuck at that point as the vocalist before Mike Patton, just says, Dear Esther. And it really lodged with me because the sound, Dear Esther, just has a, a really amazing sound to it. And I think when we started making it and the idea of it being this series of letters to someone came through, it just came straight back out of going, that's just a really beautiful sounding combination of words. And I think that really sums up the whole approach to the writing in Dear Esther of what's a really, what's the most beautiful combination of words and images we can put together and to do it that way rather than writing a traditional plot as such. So yeah, Dear Esther, Faith No More and Doom, that's where it comes from. I think the central question to the entire experience for most people that have played it or are talking about it is this idea of, is the island real? Is what's going on a literal event of a man walking across a Scottish island or is it a dream that he's had? Does the island even exist? And one of the things that we try to do with the writing is to constantly lull the player into a position where they got an understanding, they made a decision about what they thought was going on and then to undercut it. So you never actually were able to settle on any one interpretation. And that was the challenge I set myself when I wrote the original mod, was can we put a story in a game that not only lends itself to multiple interpretations, but there is no stable interpretation. Every single interpretation you have will always have questions and you'll never be able to fully trust what you think you understand about the game. Um, so it's challenging, I think, for that result. It becomes quite a challenging kind of game story because of that, because you don't ever get that situation to go, I understand it now, I can walk away from this thing and it's all closed off and it's tidy. It was a very deliberate attempt to say, no matter where you think you are with this story, you're always questioning whether or not that's right. One of the things that's been most commented on with the audio and the music in Dear Esther is how sparse it is. And that was a really deliberate tactic. I wanted to leave room for the player to think and to dream and to wonder and to put their own interpretation into what was happening. And I think the problem with so much modern media is how bombarded we are constantly. It's the kind of MTV, flash in your face, constant music. And Dan and I watch a lot of drama together, and there really is constant endless, music. Which is constantly telling you what you should feel, like, really clearly. And it's like being kind of beaten up by the music sometimes. And when you read a lot of reviews of Dear Esther, a lot of people say they had this time to think and to interpret, and that was one of their favourite things, that they placed themselves so directly into the game, and it's their experience, and I think that's actually the greatest success of the game on all points, from the story to Rob's art to the music, is we all left space for the player to dream. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, places in the game where you see a lot of strange things, and uh, this is very deliberate. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is just kind of like not spoon feed the player um, every little piece of story. We kind of just some things are literally just in there to to just kind of let you think and let you decide on whatever you want to uh, bring to the story yourself. Um, so there's, it's kind of like a, I, I approached it like a, an impressionist painting where you've got like this kind of very vague outline of things. Uh, but if you stare at it enough, you can kind of like fill in the spaces uh, and kind of the image comes together on its own. So a lot of these kind of strange uh, uh, pieces of geography and stuff, that, that's, that's, that's really kind of deliberate in some ways just to kind of uh, keep keep the player's mind open and kind of bring their own interpretations of the story through that.
When I was originally thinking about how to write the music for the game, I suddenly realised that you don't see anybody in the game and the most important character as such is the island itself. So one of the things that I did with the music was to write the island as if she or he were a character in its own right. And that's really important, I think, that you are going through this space and actually it's completely devoid of people, but the music in a way populates the island and that the voice of the island speaks to you through the music. Which is interesting because I think that's really come on in terms of later games we've done that that sowed the seeds for the way in which we approach music in Rapture where it was very specifically the voice of characters a machine for pigs as well where the music was about being Lily's voice in the game, Lily's representation in the game so it's interesting how looking back on Esther a lot of those kind of ideas were, were tried out here that then came on to take other forms and stuff we've done since. All right, let's talk about walking. Let's do it. We're going we're to address the elephant in the room, the very, very slow-moving elephant in the room. So this might be a longer um, conversation because uh, it kind of fits with that. So Esther was the first of the, the what are now called walking simulators, um, and it was really interesting that, that for us it didn't feel that weird to have a game that was slower than normal, where actually there was lots of time to just walk around and think and look at things. And it was amazing at the time how this was seen as completely revolutionary. And um, it's really interesting. It's amazing to see how many other games have kind of like taken it on board. For me, it was, it came from, I didn't see it as being odd to have a game where very little happened, where you thought about what you were doing. Um, for me, it was kind of interesting that you could play some of the best moments in Doom are the bits where nothing's happening and you're just doing it, or, or System Shock, or those games that I absolutely love. Those quiet moments were the really, um, really powerful ones. But Esther is definitely slower than a lot of games. And I think that's actually why it's lasted. I think if we'd have, we did have moments where we went, should it be faster, should we put a sprint button in? But I'm so pleased that we kind of held our nerve and went, no, just as like in real life, I don't run everywhere because that would be weird. It's okay to have a game where you don't run everywhere. And actually it is a bit weird to run everywhere. But if you're gonna do that, then you've got to support it in other ways. And I think the music was a really powerful way of supporting that change of pace. What's really funny for me though, Dan, is that shamefully I'd never played a game before I worked on Dear Esther. So I didn't realise that all games weren't like this, which is now looking <laughs> back really naive. But I didn't realise that games didn't have, you know, always have, you know, this slow pace. And I thought there were lots of meditative games out there and that actually wasn't really the case at the time and that's exploded since um, but in terms of the music supporting that pace that you'd set emotionally felt really important so if you listen to the music actually the BPM is it, it is at a very slow walking speed and it just almost, I mean, there's a lot of things now that say it's called entrainment, that it slows your heartbeat or it can speed up your heartbeat when you listen to music. And actually, I think what the Esther music does really successfully is it makes you almost accept and more than accept that that speed, you actually start to feel that that's the pace of your journey. And that I really like that about the music, actually. It just, yeah, it makes you just comfortable with that pace too. It, I think it just eases you into it. You feel relaxed. Okay. The radio mast in Dear Esther is obviously, there is a really important um, kind of design feature as well as its, its place within the story. And that, I think, came from, it was really interesting, it being a Half-Life mod to begin with, and the Citadel in Half-Life 2, that it tells you how far you are through the game. You're always looking up to the skyline, am I closer to the Citadel, can I see it? And it lets you know how near you are to the end of the game. And it was really important, because Esther's so open in a way, and because there isn't this, you're not using kind of shootouts or kind of gating it with, with combat encounters to kind of constantly keep you moving, that it was really, really important that you always had that focal point of going, I know exactly from the beginning of the game virtually right from the start. You know where you're going, you know where the game's going to end up, and you know that sooner or later you're going to be either at the base of that thing or climbing that thing, and it's always there, that red light. And I think particularly with the colour palette of the game, 
the fact that you've got this very, very, very clear red light that's unlike any of the other colours in the game immediately tells you as a player, this is what the shape of this thing is going to be. This is where I'm going. This gives me a purpose, even if the sort of moment by moment is a bit more abstract. Yeah, and navigationally as well, it helps you. It, 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 it draws you in the right direction as you play the game. You can never get lost if you just follow that one uh, landmark. Yeah, I think it's a really interesting place of where that sort of traditional game design is still, there's loads of it in Esther, yeah, it's yeah. just not necessarily done in quite the same way. So something you'll notice as you look around the environment is, uh, you know, from a distance you see the landscape, it's kind of a beautiful place in some, in some ways, uh, but <clears throat> something I wanted to bring to the to the game was that there's this second layer beneath uh, the surface. Whereas if you look at things closely, you see that the actual island itself is very polluted. It's kind of uh, very uh, rotten. Uh, it, you know, everywhere you look, every rock, every every grass surface, it has this layer of filth on it, and it's kind of been put in there just to kind of emphasize further that this island's a really unpleasant place to live. It's like if you scratch the surface you see like just how corrupt this island is. We cast and did all the voice direction for Esther ourselves for the mod and it was basically uh, Jess and I on um, a casting website just listening to people's showreels and finding what's the voice of this thing and it was there was never any question about Nigel. I think we heard his showreel for the first time around. He's probably been listening to sort of 30 or 40 actors. And we started listening to his showreel and just both looked at each other and went, that's it, that's him. And it was amazing when, when Nigel came in. We had, I think, a day and a half to do the whole thing. And he just did that amazing thing that really, really great actors did. If he just walked in, got in front of the microphone, and more or less did the entire thing in one take. And we did hardly any retakes on anything. It just felt like his instinct for the character in the game was so strong that he just, without virtually any direction, just came in and just got it. And one of the hardest things with the voiceover that we did was when we went from the mod, which had three potential narrative units per queue, to four potential narrative units per queue, was not only finding new bits of writing that kind of complemented and played off what was there in the original mod, but for Nigel to come back in, what, nearly five years later, and to just re-find that voice in exactly the same way and deliver it in a way that fitted in and complemented it was a real testament to his ability as an actor, I think that apart from the, we had spent quite a lot of time trying to make the, the sound actually sound the same in terms of mic placement and things like that, but in terms of the actual delivery of those new monologues, you wouldn't know that that was both written and acted sort of four and a half years after the original thing was done. So the one person who's not in the room sort of today but deserves a huge amount of credit for how the game kind of eventually was delivered, but also I think in terms of how the game has lasted, um, a huge amount of respect needs to go to, to Nigel Carrington for his work on it. So this hole in the ground was kind of a, a difficult thing in some ways. It's a bit of a challenging aspect of the game. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in, in some ways, it kind of like, I think for me, we, we wanted to have this this kind of this this pit here, and we, I, I wanted Leia to be able to actually go as close as possible and like look over the edge and and, and you know kind of have this feeling of, of dread and stuff. But the other issue that we faced was like, what happens if the player just jumps into the hole? Like yeah. we we have no real death in the game, and uh, from a design point of view, Dan, I mean, I don't know what you. It was really hard because, yeah. you know, it was a, a game where we, we couldn't let the player die. We didn't want to have respawns, but we had to handle the fact that there would be both accidents where the player would, would fall off a cliff or something, but also the deliberate urges of the player. Yeah. You know, the first thing you're going to do is go, great, there's an ocean, how far out can I go? Or yeah. there's a cliff that's really high, can I jump off it? And how do you have death in a game where you can't have the player die? Because if the player starts breaking up the experience by dying and reloading, then you're in a really, you start breaking the experience a lot. So, yeah, I mean, we, did, uh, we didn't want to also have, like, artificial boundaries, you know, where yeah. it's like an invisible wall. 
Um, like if you if you take a look through the game, you'll never see a place where you think you can get to, but you can't. There's always some kind of actual natural boundary or uh, man-made boundary. So yeah, that was that was the other thing. We didn't really want to create this invisible wall around this thing. So it kind of the whole drove the the way in which that sort of the the very weird audio visual, probably one of the most dreamlike bits in the game, where if you do die and you get the kind of the, the heartbeat and the um, the strange flashes of visuals. And they, I think in a lot of ways, if we hadn't had the hole there, and we hadn't had a, a place where we go, right, players will jump in this hole. We have to start from that basis. They will throw themselves down this hole. It kind of gave us the impetus to really, really focus on it. And I think the stuff like the drowning deaths and the cliff deaths are strong because the hole was there. And I'm not sure if the hole hadn't been there, yeah. whether or not we'd have arrived at those that way of handling it, which I'm, I'm really proud of. I think it's a really incredibly creative, interesting way of handling a player going out of bounds and, and of actually being able to reset the game when the player's basically done something you ideally wouldn't want them to do. Yeah, I, I kind of think it fits well with the theme of the game as well because you don't really know what's just happened. Yeah, it's absolutely. Not like, it's not like you you hear a death sound and then you kind of respawn. It's this kind of like very soft, uh, very ambiguous change. You yeah. Know? There was a point in the original model where if you died, it would do the whole Half-Life major yeah. fracture detective. Yeah. It's always a really good tone to the game. Yeah, yeah. One of the really important jobs of a composer, I think, is to provide the player or the listener with different emotional tones and states. And up until this point in the game, the music has been very sparse, very intimate, and very isolating in a way. But the island is also a beautiful and magnificent place. And what I wanted to do at this point for the first time in the game is to create something that was really epic. So we go from that shift in scale where it's very intimate and small to suddenly realising that this is an extraordinary and magical place to be as well as a difficult and uh, quite sad and uh, melancholic place to be. So the string players were instructed at this point and to play with much more vibrato. Um, up until this point, they've played in a very sort of Scottish style, actually. No vibrato, very plain playing. But this was a really beautiful cue to write, actually, because it that has that scale. You suddenly realise that the island is really big and, um, it, it, you know, you have this beautiful vista and the music then shifts so the player can actually, just for a moment, I think, enjoy being where they are. Yeah, I think that's it. Can I? Can I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, this is actually one of my favourite parts of the, of the game. It's just where everything, all the elements kind of come together perfectly. You've got the, the, the music, which just is just epic, as Jess has said. You've got the landscape, which is kind of like this big open space. Um, you've got all the little uh, bits and pieces that I put into the detail detail of the environment, like the movement, there's leaves blowing around, there's the clouds in the sky, uh, there's the, the mist rising off of the uh, off the grass, and then you've got Dan's voiceover uh, coming in there, and I think it's it's just like all of these elements coming together and just in perfect synergy and just, just kind of, it really brings, uh, you know, chills up your spine. Inside the Bothy, there is um, a randomised chance you can find an ultrasound picture on the table. And I think it's the one instance of randomization in the game that is like the pinnacle of it, because the idea that Esther was pregnant when she died changes everything emotionally about how you understand the story. And not to say that you don't care as much if you don't find it, but it just adds this other layer of just the ground falls away from him the first time I saw it. And, the meaning of the, the, the crash in Esther's death just means so much more when you go, it's not just about her, there is a, there is an unborn child here. And I think that's where the, the randomization just hits its absolute peak because it's one tiny detail that may or may not be there. But if it's there, it's gonna fundamentally change the way you feel about the entire thing. And that's the strength that the randomization elements in Esther kind of provide, that you go, you're likely 
kind of feeling about the story and your understanding about the story can be changed so absolutely by the occurrence or not of one tiny little prop detail. And that's something which those moments I think are what make it really, really special. So it's it's for me it's it's almost like the most important prop in the game because when it happens it's so profound. Yeah, and it's it's uh, again, it's just something that makes each playthrough more personal. I think, it, and it's this is what I love reading about. You know, people finding these things and going, "Holy shit! I've just found this one thing that's going to change it. That's changed my interpretation completely." Yeah, absolutely. So as you leave the Bothy and the Seagull takes off, that's the one jump scare in the game, which is kind of interesting because when we made it, we kind of had to, you know, we kind of called it a ghost story, but there was no intention really. We kind of wanted this dreamy, hallucinatory type thing. But when it came out, people started coming back and saying, this game is absolutely terrifying. I was really, really frightened. And that was really amazing. And I think it's because nothing happens. We're so trained in games to go there's stimulus all the time that if nothing happens you're waiting for something to happen and kind of I tend to talk go back to again and again the, the whole sequence in Dead Space 2 when you go back to the Ishimura and it's like the best bit of Dead Space 2 because for what feels like hours but it's probably only about 15 minutes nothing happens and no necromorph comes at you and it's absolutely terrifying because it's just this space and you're just left in it so I think the kind of the bird here is really interesting because it can actually really really make you jump but I don't know if that was part of why people were saying that the game was really scary, but it was a real surprise when people started coming back and saying, this is a frightening game. Um, and I don't know how much of that is to do with the ideas in the game are frightening when you think about them, and how much of it is to do with just the emptiness and the lack of kind of things in the game make it a really quite stressful or quite frightening place. But it was a real surprise, I think, that sort of reaction from a lot of players when we, when we shipped it. So one of the things that influenced the visuals quite a lot was uh, the tech limitations at the time um, and also the, the kind of themes of the game. Like tech-wise, we were never ever going to kind of achieve photorealism. And I think that was a good thing. I mean, really, it kind of it made us sort of stretch out into other areas. And uh, for me as an artist, it kind of made me think a little bit more creatively. Um, I did a few tests at the beginning, and, I, and when I realized this wasn't possible, I kind of went back and I kind of did some research on different styles, and one of the ones that really struck me was this kind of impressionistic painterly style, uh, where it's kind of like it, there's just enough shape and color there for you to form an image, but it's, it, a lot of it is just your imagination. It's kind of like the, the, re, the believability of the environment is in your mind. Um, so this is something that I really wanted to bring over into the into the game, and uh, you'll see a lot of a lot of landscapes that kind of look very surreal, uh, very um, kind of unreal, and uh, that's mainly due to this impressionistic uh, style. We should probably talk about some of the inspirations behind it. Um, I'm on a, a strict you don't talk about stalker kind of uh, oh. thing going on here. But, but when Rob and I started talking, I think one of the first things that we kind of discovered was yeah. how much we're both obsessed with stalker. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that was one of the major things behind it in terms of when people talk about game inspirations. I mean, for me, there's a lot of, of FPS stuff in there, Doom, System Shock, but I think stalker probably more than anything else. And Roadside Picnic, the, the Strugatsky novel that stalker's based on, of the idea of this this incredible space that you didn't understand that's simultaneously beautiful and threatening and I think sort of Tarkovsky's kind of films kind of play into that as well oh, yeah. his version of Stalker that you yeah. want to have this place that you feel rather than think about and for me that was like really kind of core to all of the inspirations for the game was this is a space that is about feeling not thinking yeah I think the, the movies in particular I think I hadn't watched the movies uh, I'd read the book and I played the game, but when I watched the movie, it kind of all made sense to me, like why I like the game so much and why I like the story. Uh, it, it's just like every shot is like a painting. It's like every shot has its story to tell. There's very little dialogue in the actual movie itself. There's just these long lingering shots. And the, each shot is amazingly beautiful. 
and in its kind of desolation. And for me, that was like a huge influence, you know, like trying to bring some of that through into the environments. So that that is definitely something I'm going to struggle not to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but the game as well, I, I'd say the game, the actual stalker game is, has a big place in my heart, like gaming wise. It's one of the reasons I got into game art in the first place. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so that that to me is a, is a big is a big part of it, too. One of the more in, uh, interesting and, and challenging things to do in the, uh, the visual side of things is to kind of create a, a, an emotional connection with the player. Um, with the music, it, it's, it's very strong and, and the dialogue can kind of help you to, to, to feel what the character's feeling, but to kind of really create an atmosphere and to create emotion, it's very difficult. Um, so I, I designed a few things very subtly within the environment to kind of plant imagery into your mind and kind of make you feel uh, certain things. Um, with this shipwreck on the beach, you can kind of, like, if you look at it from certain angles, you get this real, like, uh, uh, like it's like a cross sticking up. It's this kind of semi-religious imagery. But it, it really kind of, it's it's not obvious. It's not in your face. It's just kind of like something that makes you feel like something you know and uh, so like there's a lot of lot of uh, deliberate attempts in the game to to recreate that feeling uh, and it's it's kind of hard to point out in many other places but it's it's done in a way where every every single rock every single plant every single cliff face has been deliberately placed and designed in a way to try and make you feel something in the game. This is another of my favourite bits in the game where you come along the edge of the, uh, the sort of gully and you find hundreds of books and it's one of the first times where most explicitly there's the suggestion that nothing you're seeing is real because there's just no way that this can exist and it's a really amazing uncanny moment but it works I think for me because you just go I don't understand it but it's lodged somewhere in my head and I can't get rid of it and I can't unsee this. And I think for me, like in terms of my influences from, from books, I mean, there's the obvious sort of stuff like with Burroughs, Cut Up and things like that going on. But it comes to the kind of books that I really love that like Road Type Pinnacle, or the other one by the Stragatskis as well, I absolutely love is The Ugly Swans. That's just full of these images that you go, I don't understand. I literally have no idea what's going on here, but I can't shake it. It's just got its hooks in me. And I think more recently you've got books like... Um, Jeff Vandermeer's Annihilation does this so well where nothing is understandable but you feel the logic but you can't understand the logic but you, you feel like the logic's there um, and that I think is a really powerful thing that games are so good at doing of creating these things and I think where a lot of game writing for me becomes kind of the wheels fall off it is that they have these amazing ideas and then suddenly there's this huge rush of going right we've developed this mythos and we've shown you all the tips of the iceberg which are really interesting but now we're just going to show you the whole iceberg and actually that's never that satisfactory as a player because it robs the mystery and I think the best game writing is those those kind of moments where you go I feel like there's something just outside the edge of my vision or just on the edge of my hearing but it's the confidence to go that's it, that's all you get, and the rest of it is up to your imagination. And I think it does loop back to games like Stalker. I think Skyrim at its best does it so well, where you just have these moments where you think, I want to know, but it's going to be down to my imagination to draw those things. And the player's imagination is the most powerful thing you've got in your design kit. There is nothing you can put on screen, there is nothing you can do with audio, there's nothing you can do with dialogue that will ever be as powerful as the player's own imagination. So if you oversell the idea and oversell the image, what you're actually doing is you're kind of not only robbing the player of the opportunity to invest in the game, but you're also fundamentally opting for a weaker tool than what the player can bring to the experience themselves. One of the really important images in the game is the radio mast. And the soundscapes that I wrote for the game are really tied into this idea. 
So it's the, the concept of the tortured sounds that are they're so broken down, they're so manipulated. And it really is supposed to represent the inner state of the protagonist at this point. It's that fractured understanding. So it kind of works on two levels, actually. We have the narrator who's trying to understand the journey that he's on. And we also have the audience's journey and their struggle for comprehension to understand what's going on in the game. So this distortion, this breaking down, um, this fragmented, kind of tortured sound really ties into the idea of the radio mast and the idea of communication, actually, that the game is trying to communicate something to you, the narrator's trying to tell you something, but it's so difficult to understand what that is. The caves in the game are really interesting because it's it's a very uh, tonal shift uh, within the, the whole visual look of the game. It's kind of like this uh, more organic, more surreal, dreamlike landscape compared to what you used to before this point. It's uh, you know we we kind of used the visuals and this kind of unreal theme very subtly, uh, but here it's it's kind of at the forefront. And it's, to me, has kind of been designed as this kind of journey through the inner self, through the body. Um, and it's, it's, it's really designed to, to be a very um, different uh, experience compared to the rest of the game. This, for me, is probably the most pivotal music cue in the game and it's the one that most people write to me about to say that they are absolutely obsessed with and they love. It's the only music cue that has singing, it has a female voice and I think that's a really important shift for me. That you've gone from this beautiful string music but it's quite abstract into what is effectively a song and with lyrics so you're actually explicitly saying something as a composer at this point. The other thing that I think it's important to say for me is it's the biggest shift from the music that I wrote for the mod. It's the same music, but the act of having it sung by an amazing singer. I sang it on the original and it's really bad. And Clara Sanabras uh, re-recorded it. And it's what good actors do, it's what Nigel Carrington did, it's what good musicians do. And they take something that you've created and they just shove it up into the next level and make something that's good into something really extraordinary. And also for me, I think, it, it's a point where the environment art and the music just meld so beautifully and so seamlessly into one. I mean, on a personal level, I've played the game hundreds of times now and I still enter the caves and I look at Rob's work and I'm just absolutely over or just gobsmacked by its beauty and I just think it's a really magical moment in gaming for me actually. I know that probably sounds really dramatic but I just think it absolutely hits something where everything just works together and the music is so dreamlike. You know Rob has talked about um, the journey through the body and I think that's absolutely for me the music becomes so organic and fluid and actually very feminine and female at that point you're hearing the voice of his love I just want to say that um, I think you can divide caves and games into pre and post dear Esther I think that it's just a, a way of breaking away from reality into saying what you can do with these spaces that actually makes them this incredibly much more um, 
vividly colourful and much more kind of interpretive and look from it. It's really interesting that I, I kind of I look at caves now in, in games and I find myself going that's a very Rob Briscoe cave <laughs> and I think that's a really an amazing thing to have achieved so I, I think it's one of those it's great paying other people's work compliments I, I enjoy that because you never feel like you're being big headed about yourself but I think it is I, I think particularly it does come again down to that blend between the audio and visuals that, that just it's a real high watermark I, I, I kind of it's one of the, the areas in, in, in all of the games we've made that I'm most proud of I think as well, you think you know what you're getting with Dear yes. Esther for the first 45 minutes of the game, wherever we are at this point, and then you step into something completely unexpected and completely new, and I think it just throws the player such a curveball in such a wonderful way. I think when you're designing a game, it's very easy to get very locked into what the system can do. And you're trying to deal with all the different variations of things that if a player does this, then this, and we have to deal with the consequence here. And our lead designer, Andrew, and I talk about this all the time, about you might have an idea, but then how does this radiate out throughout the entire system? And you get very caught in the idea of what the system has to be and how robust the system has to be and this kind of thing. And I think what's really important as a, as a sort of a designer, as a creative, is that understanding that actually the real game is happening in the player's head and that the system can be whatever you want it to be but if the game isn't running in the player's head as opposed to on the screen then you're missing a trick you're not doing letting the game be everything it could be and i think the great thing about working with a, a game as simple as esther in a way is that those sort of consequences of player interaction there's not a huge number of them in the way that there might be with a very mechanically complex game so you can really heavily focus on what is the game experience that's being played out within the player's sort of mind and heart at the moment? And there are other, you know, sort of, I know this is a, a kind of a, a way of approaching game design that, that has become increasingly popular over the last few years. And that like journey was a really, really good example of that game company really focusing on what's the emotional experience of playing this game. But I think, again, that's a, it's probably one of the reasons why Esther has lasted as long as it has done, because it's not a mechanical exercise, it's an exercise in trying to inspire you as a player to have the deepest experience and the deepest engagement and to really run the game in your own head rather than being something that you, you know, you're sitting six feet away from kind of interacting with. I hate interaction as a term for that. I think it becomes very cold and mechanical and systems driven. And really interaction is completely trivial and pointless if there isn't an emotional engagement with the player and, and you haven't moved it away from the screen and into the player's head. What's really important to me is that Dear Esther started out as a Half-Life 2 mod. And if the Half-Life 2 modding community hadn't championed it and celebrated it and downloaded it a lot and talked about it and loved it, then it would never have been a game. So it's never really bothered me the kind of is it a game conversation because as far as I can see it, Dear Esther and like everything that's come after it has been inspired by it. This was championed by Half-Life 2 modders and they made it what it is. And so if you've, if you've made something that the real kind of hardcore of the hardcore in terms of these are first person shooter modders have gone this is really good and really special and we're behind this then you've already got the support of a really amazing gaming community and the fact that they championed it we, we owe them a huge amount in terms of where we are and I'm really proud to come out of that scene I'm really proud to be a company and to be sitting here talking about a game that started life as a mod yeah, I think they're, they're the ones that have really kind of like pushed us forward and given us the passion to be able to take it to a commercial uh, level and give us the confidence to, to make us believe that there's an audience for this kind of thing. Dear Esther was my first foray into writing music for games. And I actually approached it very traditionally, so more as a film score than a traditional interactive game music score. And what's really interesting for me is that the lack of interactivity in the music was never a problem for anybody that played the game. And that's a separate discussion, but there's a kind of there's a big schism between game music composers of how much the music should be following the player at all times in terms of interactive music. 
But one of the reasons I wanted to say something at this point was that this was my little first journey into thinking about how you write music for games rather than films. So I had this song that was a certain length and Dan said, well, we don't know how long the player is going to take to traverse through that space. And I thought, oh no, he's right, and slightly panicked. So this was a very simple solution where the song was split um, in half and then I wrote uh, some drone music that could just play for as long as was needed as the player um, walks through the space and then the second half of the song would seamlessly uh, play. And it's very, very simple, but it's quite emblematic for me in terms of my career because it was the first time that I had to think about the player because with film music it's so simple, you know exactly what's going to happen when. But this concept of interactivity was so new for me, so I kind of look back at it fondly because it's quite a basic uh, approach to, you know, compared to something like Everybody's Gone to the Rapture, where that was an open world adventure where I had to really think about the player and their movement through the space. So I kind of look on this very fondly, this moment in the game. I don't know when the um, the paper origami boats first came into things with Asta really, um, but it felt like a really amazing metaphor of taking these um, letters and folding them into boats and then letting them leave the island because you kind of, you know at this point in the game is kind of the realisation is there that this isn't going to end well and that the, the, the narrator is never leaving the island and the idea that this kind of again the idea of communication or the attempt or failing communication or trying to speak through the coma or whatever it is, however you want to interpret it. But the idea of putting the, the, the boat in the underground river really felt like it, it kind of reinforced that sort of dreamlike kind of quality of the caves of actually there's something really sad about this one boat because when you see it go past you know that even the boats aren't going to leave the island. Like this is this is something which doesn't have a, a tidy, neat kind of like resolution. And there's even if you don't sort of think about it to, to that sort of level of depth, there's just something. It's one of those things that I really love about games that you can do, where it's just a moment that has a really distinct emotional tone to it. That you go, there's a, a pause when you see that boat goes past. That I just think is yeah, it's something special you can do with 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 kind of media like games. In a lot of ways, the caves were the hardest area of the game to actually write because we knew we didn't want to have much voiceover in there. I think because of the strength of the music, and this goes right back to the original mod, we wanted that to be the voice and for it to be a chance for Esther to speak rather than the narrator. And we also wanted to have this break so when the narrator came out from the caves, you had a real definite sense of something happening and that he had changed as a result of this journey. So it meant really felt wrong to have a lot of voiceover within there but then that made it really difficult because then it was you had like four one sentence lines in there and each one of those had to have an absolute clarity and to really really kind of work so I think for me it was really interesting it's like the difference between writing kind of um, fiction and writing poetry when you um, read really amazing poets and you have that incredible surgical precision where every single word is considered and placed so absolutely and rather than being able to kind of because the narrator rambles quite naturally it was able to you could kind of get into the flow of the narrator's ramble in other places in the level and this was a real challenge because suddenly I was having to write like a poet of going every single one of these words every single cadence every single sound has to be absolutely perfect or it'll just feel like the narrator's voice is intruding on the rest of the experience. So it was, yeah, I think definitely the most challenging area of the game as a writer. The sound here is a classic case of, again, what music I think does really well, which is you've had this soft, lyrical, beautiful, epic, dreamlike music, and then the moment you come out of the caves, you're into this really harsh soundscape and the tonal shift is very very uh, brutal I think and deliberately so. Um, you have very little music when you come out of the cave, caves you hear the wind and it's a classic case of foreshadowing so we know from this point 
that things are probably going to get bleaker, more difficult. And, yeah, it's something that music does really well, I think, which is that emotional signalling and signposting. This whole area moved, didn't it? The original mob, this was yeah. a cave, right at the beginning of the caves where yeah. everything was written, and it moved to the back end of the level, and we had this long corridor that's full of these kind of... The real... It's the point of high madness, I think, in the game, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it's kind of just where you feel like you're losing the plot completely, both, like, visually and, and auditory, and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of like <clears throat> this really frenetic moment for me. I think it's where you feel most that you're underneath the mountain and you feel yeah. the weight of that mountain and just the... I loved the idea when we were, you know, putting through it of what would it actually take to do this? Like, to actually paint all these symbols and what is going on and it really... It's quite an explicit kind of thing of madness of going, you would have to be insane or very, very disturbed to actually do this and what is the process that this person is trying to work through, what they trying to achieve by this and I think it really strengthened it making it a crawl through a tunnel as opposed to just a static location Yeah I think it's the the, the consistency and the, the coherence of the, the symbols is a lot more uh, broken down as well, like you see some symbols before uh, like scattered around the environments but at this point they're like right in your face and they're kind of just it's just total madness, you know. Any kind of uh, meanings have been crossed over and, and confused, and you know, I think it really helps to bring the tension up uh, yeah. at this point at the level as well. So you're kind of coming out of this dreamlike state a little bit. Yeah, you kind of know that you're getting towards the end of the serenity into something that's a bit more disturbed than that. Yeah. motorway scene the biggest the, 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 the biggest new addition to the between the mod yeah. and, the, and the commercial version this didn't exist in the mod at all it was a completely new thing yeah it's uh, well we I wasn't sure uh, where the idea spawned from to have this scene where I just sort of went off or we discussed it or I can't remember you know it's, I can't remember can you remember it just kind of no. appeared didn't it and then yeah it was, it was just this kind of I think for me actually I remember being some technical difficulty between the drop and then coming out at the end part but it was like it was the same thing that we dealt with in the past of like how do we not kill the player um from a, so from a technical standpoint, I think it might have been something to do that. But it was also, you know, it just... It, yeah, I, I can't remember where the whole thing came from. I think it's my favourite point in the whole game, actually. I think it's just a, absolutely... It's quite shocking. And it's so surreal and it's so beautiful and from an audio point of view you have that baby's heartbeat bringing us back to the idea of the ultrasound was Esther pregnant and it, again it's one of those moments that I think everything just kind of collates together and it's so unexpected yeah for me it's like a moment of realisation yes it, it's like it is, you know, it's coming to terms with something almost, you know. Whether or not what actually is going on at the moment is real yeah. this was this did happen there's kind of an absolute I remember playtesting it, and um, I didn't know that the um, that the car can get switched out with a hospital gurney. And it, I must have played it. I was like three or four times into playtesting it. And the first time it switched out, and it was a gurney. So I really remember kind of sitting there and going, "Oh God, that's just and really being just stopped in my tracks by it." And it's one of those weird things you get when you're making a game that you know you'll never have that same those moments that a player does, where you know it all so well. It's really, really rare to be in a situation where you actually get a genuine, fresh player's eye view on what you're making. Yeah, I was I was always a bit worried that it was maybe a bit too literal. Like, we, we've gone a bit too literal with that. But I think, looking back at it now, there's still a lot of strangeness going on there. Obviously, it's the whole scene is, is unusual, but there's still these, like, very subtle uh, details that are there that kind of still making you think, what, you know, what does that mean? Like, I, I think if you look closely, there's, like, 
uh, coins scattered yeah. around and, and things like that. It's, it's, it's and for me, it's, again, sorry to keep going on about it, but it's about layers of subconscious for me, that you start over ground, you go into the caves, you go deeper, you're falling down, it's going down the rabbit hole, effectively, yeah. and then you go to the deepest level, and that's actually the truth, that's the reality, that's what happened. So the admission really is is that um, I did play fast and loose with the geography of the M5. There is National Welcome Break <laughs> Services just outside the junction of Sanford. But as we also been know pointed as out as to you. players. Of, I mean, what a, what a thing is it if you make something that's based vaguely on somewhere in real life in terms of a compliment when you're getting emails from from players going. There isn't a welcome break there, and people really trying to work out where is this and hold threads about where on the M5 it is. That's just the most amazing feeling. But I think what I really love about, what I think works really, really well in Esther, and again, it's something that I think is really carried forward to our other games, is that a lot of the time we're not dealing with kind of like big, glamorous, amazing, epic places. It's a sort of like a ratty little island in the Hebrides. It's someone who lived in Wolverhampton. It's, it's just outside, you know, a service station on a stretch of the M5. And I think that earths it, it earths what's going on. It makes gives it a realness as well, particularly when you sort of put it against the the surrealness of the caves. Actually, you're kind of going, this is really surreal and this is really, really dreamlike, but actually I'm talking about, you know, a car accident just outside a little chef. And it kind of... It, that playing off those two things against each other. It's like making the ordinary extraordinary. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This scene for me is like really, really iconic because it kind of brings this idea of the, the caves being an inward journey through the body uh, together. It's, it's really kind of like a, a symbol of rebirth and it, it actually brings together a lot of the visual uh, goals that I wanted to achieve uh, with a lot of the symbolism in the game. Like uh, I've talked a little bit about how uh, the environment was kind of designed to provoke emotions and, and kind of the impressionistic style gives you just enough information to make you think of things and feel things. Um, but this is like, this is probably like the antithesis of this. Um, uh, and the whole feeling of rebirth here is, is quite strong. Um, I know Jess... Yeah, the music's really supporting that. Yeah. Because we've gone, she sings always, always throughout, you know, we've got always, always, and then she sings never, and a moment of absolute soaring. It's the climax yeah, as of you, the music. As you come out of the water and the music kind of swells and you just kind of... It is like a... A, a moment of change has happened yeah. in some way. and I It's think, rebirth, isn't it? It's, yeah. I, for me, it's his moment of clarity yeah. and acceptance and understanding of the reality of what's happened. And you're yeah. literally moving towards the light at the end of the tunnel. Yes. You, you're actually doing that as you go through. But I, I, the music especially, I think before the music got layered in, that scene was nowhere near as kind of powerful for me. Like, that kind of just totally made it. Dan and I had worked on lots of projects together, non-game projects, before we uh, made Dear Esther. And I think the thing that links all of the projects that we've worked on together is the idea of hidden stories and layers of stories. And one of the things I wanted to do with the music was to embed hidden little hints and stories into it. So uh, the music that you hear here has Morse code and the Morse code is spelling out the word Esther. And I really, really liked this concept of that some people would understand that it was Morse code and try and figure out what it was saying. It also provided a really interesting rhythmical dynamic. And yeah, it's just about these ideas of hidden stories and layers. 
but it also starts to emphasise the obsessional nature, I think, of the story in Dear Esther and his agitation and actually slight panic. So you're getting this rhythm that just repeats and repeats and repeats obsessively. So I think even if you don't understand that it's saying Esther, and even if you don't understand that it's Morse code, you're still getting this feeling of this obsessional repetition and slight panic that he has. And again, it's kind of... It's, it's, it's the new chapter and it's spelling out that something has changed at this point. It's probably the level which has changed most from the original mod, I think. It's much, much bigger than the, the final um, level in the mod. One of the major changes in there is in the original mod, the whole side of the cliff face was covered in painting and writing, and a lot of that moved inside to that corridor in the caves where it's really obsessionally painted on. And it was really, it took, we spent so long on that because we were trying to get it looking right. Because I really, it's one of those really interesting examples where I loved the image and the idea that you've got this, this guy painting the entire side of a mountain with, with words and symbols and things. But it was really interesting, when it went into the rebuild, it just never worked. And I think it was because the environment was so crude in the mod that the, those symbols and that painting became the focus of the level and it changed the feeling of the level completely when actually that just wasn't something we could realise in any way that not even technically but just didn't artistically look and feel right and I think probably sort of retrospectively looking back on it that's about the, the sort of the sophistication and the subtlety that then came into the art rather than just being this is literally just a canvas that we write words on to actually the environment telling its own story without the story being literally painted on it. Yeah it, it was it was very difficult when we were experimenting with that to kind of like make it not completely unreal. Like I think for me it was kind of, I wanted to kind of bring the player a little bit back into reality after the caves. And I think with having those, those symbols everywhere, it was kind of pushing them out a little bit. Um, so I think what we came to, the kind of compromise we had, it was, it was kind of a nice in-between yeah, it didn't feel like a compromise to me. It felt oh, really? like, no, it felt like it was. It didn't yeah. work, but it kind of. But the, the, those those symbols were coded. Like there's the, the the hill in the background when you're standing right at the end of the boat and you look back and it's you suddenly realise that the shape of the mountain is the shape of a woman lying on her side asleep. And that I remember seeing for the first time around and going, it's saying the same things, but it's saying it in a much 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 subtler way than um, in the initial layer. But it was definitely challenging going back to how do you have a deep, complicated, subtle art style, but still managed to have something which is very sort of stark and symbolic laid over the top. It was much more challenging. I think one of the most fascinating things for me about planning this director's commentary has been that in previous years, when we've all the three of us have talked about Dear Esther, we've talked about the interpretation of the player, but actually going through this together, post having made it, we're still surprising each other. Yeah, and I think yeah. that's really, really interesting for me because it shows that we left interpretation for each other and that we trusted each other actually just to get on with it. And because we each brought our own special and unique contribution to the game we didn't have to in a way talk it to death or say you have to justify every idea you have or talk it to death or explain it that rob's idea that the island is very tainted and corrupt and my idea that dan didn't know that the whole uh, level of the caves is a birth metaphor i think it's really amazing that we're still finding out things yeah, about I, the game that we didn't know. I think it, it, it was nice when I, when I came onto it because Dan was basically like, uh, he gave me a, a bunch of materials, but he, he left me to my own devices for a lot of it. And we kind of like, we you know, I finished the level and Dan would play it and give me some feedback, but he was very kind of like hands off at the beginning, which was really nice, you know, kind of. So a lot of my interpretations just came through that, that downtime where I was just kind of like going off and doing my own thing. And... Uh, so yeah, it's like interesting to hear Dan talk about it sometimes because like, there's there's some backstory that I've I've n never even considered before, and obviously see, hearing Jess talk about it as well is really interesting, especially when it comes to the soundtrack. It makes me look at things in a very different way. So yeah, it's really interesting.
I think for me, like game making games is so inherently collaborative, and you have people coming together with different ideas and different takes on things. And in a way, the least interesting thing you can do with that is to structure it all so heavily that there's no space for each individual person to to bring what they're thinking to it. And I think the best games. Well, for me, my, my favourite games are ones where you can really feel the personal footprint of each individual developer and aspects of it, and it feels like it has been a genuinely collaborative exercise where everybody has thrown ideas into the mix and everybody is bringing something to the table rather than people are just following a, a kind of a really structured plan. So, yeah, I, I think it probably is one of the reasons why Esther has had the sort of life it's had since release is because there is... There's three people, four people if you include Nigel, all bringing very different things to it and it gives it a very, a huge amount of depth for something that's so simple on the surface. I'd been on holiday to Greece lots of times and one of the things that I always really responded to emotionally was those shrines that you see on the road and sometimes they're dedicated to saints and sometimes they're to mark eight where uh, an accident has taken place so you'll get photos of the deceased person and flowers and candles and it always really touched me and so I said to Rob I think it would be amazing to get these into the game um, somehow and then Rob took the idea and ran with it and I think they're so successful and they're so beautiful and they're really moving and I think it's because you had this elemental scale, you have the island and it's huge and you have that scale and all of a sudden you come round this corner and it's absolutely brought back to the human scale again and to that relationship of the individual. And I think the other thing that it does really successfully is it's a kind of magic realism because there's no way that you could have all those amounts of candles lighting your way. Who's lit them? The island is empty. Who's put those shrines there? But I just think it's a really lovely bit of environmental storytelling, actually. One of the really nice things about the move from the mod to the commercial version is that we had a couple of years worth of the community talking about the game before we went back into it again and one of the things that I read on a forum was that uh, someone had, had constructed this amazing version of the story where they decided that the narrator was Paul and I hadn't thought of that it was never part of the original writing and I thought that's so amazing that as a writer your audience can come can find something in what you're doing that you hadn't thought of so it was really important when we went back in to record the additional set of voiceovers I thought I absolutely want to do so I want to take this idea that's come out of the fans and to run with this and to add an entire new sort of stream of, of story in there so we added in a couple of um, cues within the force level that intimated much more strongly that actually Paul wasn't this other character who caused the accident, but actually you were responsible for everything. But again, it was then trying to find that balance of not overcooking it, so you weren't led to that idea. But just if you happen to have the combination of just a couple of narrative units, then you would possibly come to that interpretation. But it was really amazing to be able to say, it felt like giving something back to the fans that had enabled us to make the remake in the first place. And that's, it's, it's always a lovely moment as a developer to be able to recognise your fan community and kind of say, thanks, this one's yours, this one's here for you. What's fascinating to me, Dan, is that you're an atheist, but each of the three games that we've made are so strongly about religion, either the language or taking allegories and stories. Why are you so drawn to it? I think... I'm really interested in people and um, the stories that make up people. And I think there is a, like in, in the Bible, like most kind of religious texts, it's not about what it is, it's about what is behind what it is. And that's what you're really getting towards, the idea of the sort of the parable or the, or the metaphor. And it really felt like, particularly with um, uh, Paul on the road to Damascus, is a story that, that many, many, many people know and we can understand. And it's about redemption and consequence and guilt and transformation and who you really are and what that means and it felt like just a really strong powerful way of making it very accessible the narrator's kind of in a turmoil in a, in a kind of a, a story that we we know really well 
And there's a universality to those kind of questions that, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, Christianity, whether it's, it's Islam, whether it's, it's kind of Buddhism, that they're, they're asking very broadly similar questions. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a good person? How should we behave to each other? How should we feel about the world we're in? And it's a really powerful way of speaking to a lot of people. I think that's always been really important as well, is that it's, it's, it's about saying no matter who you are or what your kind of like outlook on, on, on life is, whether that's you know, faith-based or, or secular, that we are all effectively asking the same questions. And that's why I think all our games kind of tend to be around those questions. Is Dear Esther a depressing game or a hopeful game? Um, for me, it's it's kind of like a mix of both, really. I think, like my my interpretation is kind of like I always feel like kind of depressed when I think about the the kind of turmoil that this guy's been going through for God knows how long, and the kind of environment he's been in, and you know all these events surrounding his story. But for me, I always feel like a little bit hopeful at the end. You know, the the, the conclusion is just feels like a, a relief. And like this is kind of all ended in some way. Um, what do you think, Jess? I think it's a game about acceptance, and I really like that. And I think it's telling that a lot of people with mental health issues have responded really positively to the game, and we get a lot of emails and um, letters from those people saying that it's helped them through a really difficult time. And for me, that's because. It's about the struggle of being human, that it's hard and that we love and that we grieve and we lose, but we come through it. And those things are what makes us human, that it's transformative and that the pain is part of life. And that's a really beautiful message. And I think that's what you do so well, Dan. That's what you write about. You write about what it is to be human. So, Dan, you wrote it. <laughs> um Without wanting to cop out, one of the things about writing it that I really wanted to do was to make something that people could take and could own and it would be their take on it. And their interpretation of it mattered in a way that mine didn't. My job was to give them the architecture to interpret in their way. So I think that is a cop out. <laughs> I do. I think as a I think writer you always have. Yeah, I think it's redemptive. But I don't think the redemption is as cut and dried as it's all OK at the end. It's not OK at the end. But there is, there is a release, there's an escape, that bad times will happen, but they will end. And they won't always end positively, but they will end. And that's the, I think, the redemption of it, of saying that you... you this too shall easy. pass. This too shall pass, Which my mum yeah. always says, you know, and I think that's probably the motto of the Chinese room, yeah, actually, Yeah, absolutely. Isn't it? Like, I don't think it's as... as kind of openly positive as say Rapture had a much more strongly positive end I don't think Esther has, I think it's much greyer than that um, but I think fundamentally it's about coming to terms So Dear Esther is the first walking simulator how yeah. do you feel about walking simulator? Uh, you know what I was I think I, I took offence to it when it first became a thing, but uh, you know I think actually I don't mind it so much now. I think the fact that we have kind of taken ownership over it, like our that genre has been kind of uh, made our own by not just our game, but like a bunch of different games have kind of embraced it. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I'm still really confused about the need to categorise in games probably more than any other creative industry and I think it shows that games have a long way to come in terms of how we describe an experience. So I do agree with Rob that it's really positive that we reclaimed Walking Simulator but I still find it reductive possibly as a term. What about you, Dan? I think for me it's it's people want to know what they're, what they're buying and what they're getting into. And I think it's so... People understand what a walking simulator is now in a way that if it was like first-person adventure or slow-moving, not very interactive, story-driven games, they're all sort of really very fluffy. But I think if you buy a game and someone says it's a walking simulator now, you, you've got a pretty good idea what you're getting. And there's been, you know, there's Gone Home, Firewatch, Stanley Parable. There's so many other really good titles that kind of fall within that group of games out there now that it does have 
an identity and I think that's the really good thing about it I mean when Esther came out there was literally nothing we had no idea how we described it or no, what we called it we actually it. struggled with that quite a lot when it yeah came to and sort of ended up being sort of like a ghost story because it felt like it was the closest thing we could get but it feels like now you can make a game like this and you can say it's a walking simulator and people will know what it is straight away yeah I think I think that's the nice thing is, is there's a whole group of games out there now that, that quite comfortably put themselves into that category and so it's, it's like if we were to come out before and just said it's a walking simulator people would have been like well that sounds terribly boring. That doesn't, <laughs> why the hell would I play that? But now people kind of are a Seek little bit them out. Yeah, now people are kind of familiar with what that means. Uh, the people that are there who actually seek this sort of stuff out, and it's kind of really cool. I mean, me myself, I would actually do that, use that as a term to search. But yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a very simplified term for what our game is, uh, and there's obviously a lot more to it than walking. Um, but I think when you look at other genres, that they're also kind of very simplified. You know, first-person shooter, role-playing game. Uh, it's you know, it, uh, to me, it doesn't seem as bad as any of those other things. There's a bit of an illusion of simplicity with uh, games like Dear Esther that people kind of assume because there's not a lot of mechanics and there's not much going on in that sense that they're easy to make. And I think actually it's kind of the opposite in a way that because they're so simple, everything is exposed and everything has to be exceptionally good for it to work because you are you're carrying a player's experience on a, on a fairly sparse, minimal kind of framework and that really means that every aspect of it has to be produced at a really high quality and has to be done with a lot of passion and a lot of thought. There's nowhere to hide in a game like Esther. Um, and that's something which I think carries through to the best games of this type. You can see with all of them there's a real commitment to kind of depth and a really intelligent way of approaching design and a real kind of trust in the player and a real assumption that players are smart, imaginative people who want experiences. There's no... It's not a game that it's easy to just knock off or to do with any kind of lazy attitude. You have to be really, really passionate and care a great deal and put an awful lot of thought into it if it's going to work. One of the things that I think was added uh, more frequently in the in the the final version of Dear Esther was the inclusion of a number of ghosts in the game. Um, these are not like ghosts that you'd see in a normal horror game, they're just very uh, loose uh, silhouettes that you'll see around the island, usually like quite off a distance off or just kind of somewhere that you'd barely see it out the corner of your eye. I think this is a good example of, of where it's kind of really in your face. Um, and. These are kind of just something that we put in to kind of uh, not just bring some uh, unreal elements to the island, but something supernatural as well, something that's kind of beyond uh, this world, something kind of unsettling. Um, and yeah, we've, you know, a lot of effort's been put in to make these things very subtle. I don't, didn't really want them to be like, I didn't want it to be a ghost story, uh, so to speak, but I just kind of wanted to bring some of this supernatural element into the game and, and this area is is probably one of the most prominent because you can see it just before you you go down into the the gully here um, and I think it's 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 really uh, one of my favorite scenes just because of it being so spooky so so unreal and so uh, uh, interesting. The Overlook, the point about this to me is that it's probably the, the voiceover in the game that kind of sums up the whole story and the experience. It's almost like a, a recap of everything that's gone before, before you start the final climb. And you know it's that pause before you're going to start the final climb and before the game's kind of uh, builds to a climax. But you can also see the whole level and it's like the idea that you are standing looking down on your own journey, a bit like the the idea of your life flashing before your eyes or sort of like seeing your body but being having an out-of-body experience at the moment of death. And it was really designed to try and get that feeling as the player that you stop 
and you take stock of everything and there's a bit of a sense of there's no going back you take a breath and now it finishes and I really wanted to kind of achieve that sort of sense and I, I think we did I think it really came together here that you got that sense of going right now this ends and now I move forwards to it So here it, it kind of, uh, the environment becomes a little bit more surreal again. Uh, we kind of play with the colours a little bit, bring up the saturation, it's kind of a little bit of a return to some of the more cave-like aesthetics in terms of colour, colours and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's kind of there to kind of signpost a, uh, a another significant moment in the game or something that's leading up to the significant moment. It goes back to this kind of idea of having these uh, emotional signposts in the visuals of the game um, without it being overly obvious. And, and some of that uh, emotional stuff comes through just through the colours of the environment. And, and the more saturated they are, the more kind of surreal things become. Uh, so this is kind of like a turning point in the game. It's kind of like the, the final notice of you reaching the end. The music that's playing here is uh, a repeat of another cue and originally we hear it played on the piano and the string quartet take on the piece here. And it's one of those really nice instances where we were in the studio and I had this idea of how it was going to sound and I thought it was going to be quite full and rich and, yeah, full-bodied. And then one of the string players said to me, this is wrong, actually, for what we're playing. And they said, let's take, strip out all the vibrato, let's play it in a really Scottish, plain style. And it absolutely transformed that piece, and it's one of the really special things about being a composer, is that you get to collaborate with people who come fresh to it so you have this preconceived idea of how it should be and then they say no why don't we turn it around and think about it like this and it absolutely fits and works for that scene because what we're getting at this point is a sense of fragility of an ending and it's almost reminiscent of a funeral procession it's slow and it's dirge like but yeah it was just a lovely moment where they gave something of themselves and that's what's amazing about working with live instrumentalists you're never going to get that from a sample It was possible that this last section of the game could have felt quite laborious and forced because it's two long zigzagging paths that just go up and there was a real importance to getting it right and quite a lot of work went into it. I think at this point for me, you probably as a player understand that the narrator's going to die at the end and that this is it. And that unlike where the rest of the island, there's this sense of this could just keep and keep going on forever and ever and ever and you're gonna keep the, the thing, the motif of come back, come back. But I think when you set on this path, we really wanted to have that sense of, this is it, this is the last time you're going to walk these paths, this will end now. And that sort of idea of going, you're kind of climbing towards your death, but you're also moving towards a point where that glimpse in the caves where you see the motorway and you go, I understand what this is about. For me, the whole path up the side of the mountain is about saying, it's okay. It's that kind of starting to, to kind of release it and go, it's kind of okay that Esther died. It's kind of okay that the accident happened. I know that I'm going to die. I know that this is going to end. And I know that there's nowhere for me to go apart from follow this path, but that's all right. And I really, it was very sort of hard to kind of try and find that subtle mix between the dread of it and the acceptance. It's where the positive and the negative and the kind of the loss and the redemption really start colliding for me. Um, at least certainly that was what we were trying to achieve with it.
with the climb being quite a poignant moment of the uh, of the game overall and of the story, uh, it was quite a difficult task to try and make that climb still interesting and not not too laborious because it's kind of this zigzag up there um, with nothing really. There's no real environment. You just kind of have the 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 sea on one side and the cliff face on the other. Uh, so there was there was quite a lot of work that went into kind of building up this uh, feeling of tension as you're rising and kind of making this moment as poignant as possible while still making it interesting. Uh, so a lot of effort was put into uh, building up this weather, the building up the winds and, and the, the swaying of the grass and, and kind of the volume of the soundscapes and uh, everything mixing together with the music um, and just kind of visually really trying to make this a t tense moment and I think uh, it's hopefully been pulled off all right um, and you'll notice when you get to the top this kind of tension dies and that's very purposeful you'll, you'll see no more wind it's just kind of like a, a symbolic thing where you're coming to the last moment the point of no return uh, and that's that's been very deliberately designed that way a lot of debates, didn't we, about the ending of the game and whether the player should retain control or whether it was OK to go to a cutscene at this point. I personally don't mind it. I actually actively like it because I think it works really well as a metaphor for loss of control at that point. Dan, I know you're not as keen. Yeah, I'm not. I, I would have loved the player not to have had control taken away from them, but to me it was a kind of a... It was a balance between two evils, the evil of having a cutscene and the evil of the player accidentally falling off the ladder halfway up <laughs> and destroying the ending. Yeah, I, I agree. Like, we tried... I think we tried a few different things and... The tech at the time just wasn't, the ladder tech at the time just wasn't there, so... Uh, and the other thing for me was pacing, it was, it was making sure all the music, the voiceovers, uh, the timings and everything were perfect for that final jump-off point. And uh, just letting the players kind of noodle around going up a ladder for what may have been like seven minutes, because it's a tall tower, uh, was, was kind of an impossible task. One of the things that I enjoyed the most on working on Dear Esther was um, Rob's beautiful visuals were so inspiring, but Dan's words are always so amazing to write to. I think that's where we start as a partnership. And the music at the end was so easy to write because that last voiceover is the pinnacle of the writing to me as it should be because it's the last VO so you would have failed if it wasn't good but it is just so beautiful and moving and for me talking about whether it's a hopeful ending the music is really hopeful at this point and it's really it signifies to me transformation freedom escape acceptance yeah and it was just a beautiful cue to write actually I don't know, I can't remember quite where it came from in the mod, but the moment when we went, or we could put the bird in there, and you could see the bird's shadow, and actually it, it turned from being kind of like a straightforward literal suicide into a metaphorical, or to my mind, kind of like, I always really believed that the narrator did turn into a bird just before they hit the ground, and that was really important. I think it's the, probably the strongest ending in any of our games so far. Um, but yeah, I'm very proud of the way everything came together in that last section. Yeah, I think it's the, the bird thing is particularly interesting because I think it was in the original mod, but it, the, the timings and everything were just all yeah. off and you never really saw the, the, the seagull, yeah, at least the shadow as, as well. It was all kind of like a little bit broken. And I remember when we went back in, we, and I made a real effort to try and get that shadow just out of the centre of the view, so you kind of have this hint of something happening and I think you can hear the, the sound of a seagull flapping its yeah. wings, it's like very subtle, but 
like you say, I, I kind of really like the way that came together. It kind of, it, it's very, uh, like say, it's kind of like a release, but at the same time, there's still this kind of amb- ambiguity there. It's, it's kind of beautiful. And I'm really proud that I got the uh, monitor in at the end for yeah. oh, an yeah. ending of, you know, it goes into the... Um, you know, hospital monitor signifying the flat line. And I think it's a really, it's one of those moments where you never want to be so clever that people notice it and it takes them out of the moment, but it just flows in through the music and it just feels like everything comes together at that last point. The You know, that last VO, Rob's amazing visuals and the music. And yeah, it feels like a really, really strong and beautiful ending. And then in the last second, Nigel Carrington's delivery of just those two words have come back where he just pitch perfect yeah so that's the end of the director's commentary we'd just like to say a big thank you to everyone for listening we hope you've uncovered some secrets and some facts that you didn't know about the game before we'd also like to say a huge thank you for buying the game and for all our fans who've been behind us and been behind the game and have kept it alive all these years it's a real privilege to that it's still out there, still such a, a title that people love so much. Yeah, and we're really looking forward to the future and what we can create coming up next. Thanks for listening. Cheers. Bye.